Good evening. Uh, 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 good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure to share with you the uh, review of the literature of uh, on acute kidney injury published into in critical care, which was published in 2021. What I have done today is to having uh, conducted a PubMed search using the search terms acute kidney injury, critically ill intensive care unit, renal replacement therapy, acid base imbalances. This PubMed search threw up around 25 uh, publications. When I restricted it to only clinical trials and removed animal experiments, I was then able to select four clinical trials of, of importance, which I would like to share with you today. The first of them is the acute kidney initiation, artificial kidney initiation in kidney injury study two, which was a follow-up of the AKI-KI study, was published by the same group, Stephen Godry's group from France in the Lancet in March 2021. The background to this study, we know that initiation of renal replacement therapy in acute kidney injury has been studied in four excellent randomized controlled trials. Of these three, the AKI-KI, the ideal ICU, and the largest of them all, the START AKI study, failed to show a benefit from an early start of renal replacement therapy in acute kidney injury. And in fact, was associated in some instances with the fact that of the group in whom delayed initiation of RRT were, uh, was done, a significant number, proportion of these patients, between 38 and 49% of these patients, actually were able to avoid renal replacement therapy completely. This was highest in the AKI-KI study, and there was also a significantly higher incidence of adverse events in the group which started, AK, which started renal replacement therapy early. With this, in, uh, with this background, the AKI-KI2 study aimed to study whether pushing the start of, a of RRT in AKI patients even further would confer an even more benefit to the, to, the delayed, uh, to the more delayed start as compared to the delayed start. 768 participants were uh, participated in this trial, which was an open label trial in 41 centers. The standard strategy was the delayed strategy of the previously published AKI-KI study, which was published in 2016, while patients who were randomized to the still more delayed strategy in this trial who had RRT initiated only if a life-threatening indication for renal replacement therapy occurred or if the blood urea concentration was more than 300 milligram per deciliter. In this situation, uh, the uh, oliguria criteria of 72 hours was done away in this trial. The primary outcome was the number of renal replacement therapy free days at day 28 after randomization. And the actual study was complete in March 2020 and published in March 2021. The inclusion criteria in this study included all adults in an ICU with acute kidney injury who also had either mechanical ventilation or vasopressors, they had to have acute kidney injury stage three of the KDGO classification and in supplemental criteria that had to be fulfilled, at least one of them included during the observational stage, oliguria or anuria for more than 72 hours. This was an inclusion criteria for the patient and a blood urea between 240 and 300 milligrams. There were a large number of exclusion criteria, mainly those patients who required an emergency initiation of uh, renal replacement therapy or a very low uh, life expectancy, which would make them poor candidates, as well as other normal contraindications for participating in a clinical trial. This is the flow chart of what happened to these patients, and a large number of patients needed to be screened. Once the blood urea nitrogen was more than 240 and the patient had more than 72 hours of uh, oliguria or anuria, the patients were randomized either to a delayed strategy or a standard strategy. The standard strategy, as I mentioned earlier, corresponded to the delayed strategy of the AKI-KI1 study, while the delayed took patients for uh, initiation of renal replacement therapy only if they had a blood urea of more than 300 milligram per deciliter or a life-threatening complication that could be reversed by dialysis. And all these patients were followed up until 60 days after randomization. The primary outcome was the number of renal replacement therapy free days between randomization and day 28. 
every patient received one point for each day that they were alive and free of renal replacement therapy, provided the patient survived for at least three calendar days after having been weaned from renal replacement therapy. There were a large number of secondary outcomes, too many in fact, but the ones of importance were the ICU and hospital uh, survivals, the percentage of patients receiving renal replacement therapy, the number of renal recoveries at day 60, number of ventilatory and catecholamine free days at day 28, and the duration from randomization to ICU or hospital discharge, and the number of dialysis catheter free days, and of course, catheter related bloodstream infections. In the calculation of the sample size, what was assumed that the delayed strategy group would have 17 days of catheter free of, di of renal replacement therapy free days out of 28. And this was based on the fact that this was what the, uh, the investigators claimed was studied in was the rate in the AKI KI study. They wanted the more delayed strategy to increase this parameter to 21 days. That was an increase of four days in a 28 day period. And assuming a dropout rate of 5%, the sample size calculated was 270 patients with to detect this difference with an 80% PAR and 95% confidence. Although an interim analysis was done at the halfway mark, there was no strategy necessary as uh, to avoid a type 1 error because the primary outcome was not assessed in the interim analysis. A very large number of patients were screened more than 5,300 patients required to be screened with AKI. 767 of them fitted the AKI stage 3 of the KDGO classification, of which 278 were finally randomized, 137 to the standard delayed, and 141 to the more delayed strategy. And all these were included in the final intention to treat analysis. The patients were similar at baseline. The surprisingly, the trial reports p-values despite randomization, and as we can see, there isn't a significant difference. Now, when we look at the outcomes in this study, all the patients of all patients, there was not much difference. The number of RRT free days, that is the primary outcome, was 12 days in the delayed strategy, and the more delayed actually was slightly lower at 10 days. The survivals, the number of patients who actually received renal replacement therapy was surprisingly high in the more delayed strategy. It went up to 79. So what this study appears to say is that delaying further does not re uh, rescue patients from renal replacement therapy or dialysis, but rather if one delays beyond the particular point, a significantly larger number of patients will actually receive renal replacement therapy. And there was no difference between the number of sessions, the duration of RRT, the 28 or 68 day mortality or the ICU or hospital mortality. When a multivariate analysis was carried out, there were the more delayed strategy on multivariate analysis was associated with a 65% higher risk of mortality at day 60, which was statistically significant. The other factors that uh, predicted a uh, significance was the need for mechanical ventilation, which reached significance, was the need for mechanical ventilation and the SAPS-3 score. Catecholamine was significant on univariate, but not on multivariate analysis. So how do I critically appraise this study? Yes, the study was very clearly focused. It was a well-designed study in terms of population intervention. There was a good control group and all clinically important outcomes were studied. Interestingly, while the authors, while calculating the uh, 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 proposed number of RRT-free days as 21, assumed that it would be in the delayed strategy, it would be 17. But the actual report of AKIKI shows this, that it was 19 days in the NEGM report of 2016. So surprisingly, there was a small flaw in the design of the study in the number of, of RRT-free days that was assumed. And as we can see, in actual fact, the number was significantly lower than in previous studies, both in the intervention group where it was 10 days and in the control group, which was 12 days. So clearly this population appears to have been slightly different from what was assumed based on the AKI-KI studies. The study used arbitrary limits of blood urea in the late group of 300. And it is a moot point about whether blood urea is ever a design a deciding factor in initiating renal replacement therapy. Randomization and allocation concealment were well maintained by one is to one blocks of variable undisclosed size. 
So selection and attrition bias were avoided as blinding is not possible in an intervention of this sort. Performance bias may not completely be avoided in such a group. Importantly, the groups were not comparable between randomized, despite randomization. Significantly more diabetics, vasopressor use, hyperkalemia and acidosis was seen in the more delayed strategy. And as I mentioned earlier, almost 80% of patients, even in the more delayed strategy, ultimately received renal replacement therapy. So this study was underpowered as the calculations of sample size and the actual observations differed significantly. The 95% confidence intervals were large, probably because of the underpowering, that's the small sample size. So the effect size could have been overestimated and it may not be applicable to all ICU populations. What are the take home points from this study? Clearly a blood urea threshold of 140, blood urea nitrogen of 140, which is a blood urea level of 300, may or may not be more represented of clinical practice, but is associated with poorer outcomes in terms of 60 day mortality. The small number of patients who avoided dialysis indicates that waiting too late may not be worthwhile. An ideal study should be powered for a much larger number, probably about 2000 patients, which will be done in the DREAM RCT. This trial has pushed the initiation of renal replacement further than any other trial before. But what it does is to provide reasonable assurance that one can postpone, while one can postpone kidney replacement therapy in patients with stage 3 AKI up to about a blood urea of 240, waiting beyond that may not be prudent and we need a biomarker, probably something like nephrocheck and a frusamide stress test in the future, which will help us to make these decisions. The next study that I have picked is the reduction in acute kidney injury post-cardiac surgery using balanced force diuresis with the renal guard device, another randomized control study, which was published in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery in 2021. We know that acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery is significantly high in incidence and has carries a very large morbidity and mortality. Good volume management maintenance of adequate blood pressure and avoidance of nephrotoxins, including painkillers and aminoglycoside antibiotics may reduce the incidence from 71 to about 55%. The renal guard system, which has been used in studies on contrast nephropathy mainly, has shown that the incidence of AKI could be reduced by up to 75%. It uses forced diuresis with low dose frusamide and administration of intravenous fluids in, uh, at a rate that is mo monitored with real time to the urine output. It has been endorsed in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, but has never previously been studied in the setting of cardiac surgery related acute kidney injury. So this study included patients who are undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass and specifically it picked very high risk patients, diabetics, Patients with CKD, uh, CPB time, cardiopulmonary bypass time of more than 120 minutes, anemia, and a logistic euro score of greater than five. These patients were randomized using a sealed opaque envelope technique, and this was done by an independent researcher. The patients in the renal guard system had the renal guard started in the anesthesia room uh, preoperatively uh, pre after the arterial line, central line had been inserted and the patient had been intubated. It ran throughout the uh, cardiac procedure in the operative room and six hours after transfer to the cardiac intensive care unit. Patients were managed with a zero balance, that is the volume of urine output was exactly matched by an infusion by the renal guard system of Hartman's fluid replacement. Diuresis was initiated at induction of anesthesia with a bolus of rosamide and if necessary, maintained by a rosamide infusion titrated up to 10 milligrams per hour. In the cardiac intensive care unit, it could be continued for up to six hours if necessary, while the control group received standard of care. Inotropic support was maintained to a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury and the cardiopulmonary bypass flow at a cardiac index of 2.4 liters per minute per square meter. This is the renal guard system. As we can see here, it has an infusion device with a measuring scale and a urine output, the urine output measuring scale as well, which is transduced to a simple Foley's catheter. It includes a closed loop system 
a high volume fluid pump and a high accuracy double weighing scale measurement a single use iv set and a urine collection system that interfaces with the foley catheter the console measures the volume of urine in the collection bag and infuses a preset volume of hydration fluid to match the urine output with a gravimetric balance the user is allowed to set the parameters for achieving a fluid gain fluid loss above or below the hydration or as was done in this study a zero balance and also boluses can be given in an emergency so this is again a schematic as well as a picture of the renal guard device this is the infusion bag here this is the pump and this is the screen on which the uh, rates of replacement fluid are set and here the urine bag measures its weight is measured on this scale so the study was the analysis was done by a binary logistic regression backward elimination method controlled for a large number of parameters age gender study group urgency type of surgery etc so significantly large number of parameters included and then eliminated by backward elimination p value of less than 0.05 was considered significant the following assumptions were used in calculating the pa they used looked at their own uh, cardiac database and showed that high risk patients had a risk had a rate of just over 40% of developing aki so assuming that this would be reduced by 60% by the renal guard device 110 patients had to be randomized to each group in order to achieve the primary end point with a par of 80% and a confidence of 95% so 1902 patients over 2 years 3 years were screened 1248 met at least one inclusion criteria the research team screened 305 and eventually recruited 220 110 in each group and almost all of these there were just three dropouts in the uh, renal guard group and two dropouts in the control group so almost all the patients completed the study making the intention to treat analysis valid there was a significantly uh, higher urine output in the patients who you, who were randomized to the renal guard device at in the operation theater at 6 hours in the cardiac intensive care unit and at 24 hours the aki rate was halved in the patients who uh, received the renal guard uh, device related treatment and at follow up it was not significantly different but there was a significant benefit which persisted on the multivariate analysis when controlling for all the other variables there was an odds ratio in the control group of developing aki which was almost three times that of the uh, uh, renal guard uh, 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 treated group with a 95% confidence interval between 1.2 and 6.6 And this is what was shown the incidence of aki even in high risk patients with the renal guard device was dropped down to about 10% while it was close to 21% so more than double in the control group if we appraise this paper it was a very well focused study in terms of population there was clinical equipoise because the renal guard device this is the first paper to assess the renal guard device in cardiac surgery though it has been used in other settings so well focused trial in terms of population an excellent intervention controls received standard of care and the outcome was a hard outcome of acute kidney injury although mortality was extremely low in both groups just one patient in each group so 99% survivals made mortality an impossible outcome in this trial not really required either there was no selection or attrition bias as there was good follow up of all the patients randomization was done without blocking so no selection bias since this was a device used blinding was not possible so performance bias is possible and is not mentioned in the study the treat the effect treatment effect size is good the calculated number needed to treat which i worked out is about 9 patients so for every 9 patients treated with the renal guard device one additional acute kidney injury will be prevented with moderate sized confidence interval the results would be applicable to high risk patients and once one overcomes what will probably be the initial cost of a device like the renal guard the intervention will probably be cost effective when one considers the morbidity and cost of managing an acute kidney injury in a cardiac surgery setting the third trial that i have picked to discuss is the reverse aki study 
This is a pilot randomized control feasibility trial published in intensive care medicine in 2021. This, uh, I'm sure that the main trial will randomize a much larger number of patients. This is a similar situation to what was done by Ron Wald's group with the star take care study where they published the feasibility study five years before the actual trial was completed. And this was published also in intensive care medicine. The background to this trial is that fluid therapy is the traditional cornerstone of acute kidney injury prevention and treatment, but patients with AKI are especially prone to develop fluid overload. And once fluid overload, especially in uh, of more than 10% to 20%, it's associated with an increased mortality and end organ damage, not only of acute kidney injury, but of other organs as well. Trials among general ICU patients with sepsis and ARDS have found rest fluid restriction strategies safe. Even a benefit was seen in the terms of AKI in the ARDS net study. While uh, patients, so this was a multi center, multinational, unblinded, investigator initiated randomized control pilot study, which com compared a restrictive, a very simple restrictive fluid management regimen to controls among ICU patients in five European and two Australian. ICUs. The hypothesis was that a lower cumulative fluid balance would be seen in patients who were randomized to a restricted fluid regimen. And the patients were randomized in with an electronic platform and an IVRS using a one is to one allocation in permuted blocks, which were of varying sizes. And the statistician who conducted the data analysis was blinded to treatment allocation since the caregivers could not be. The inclusions were patients 18 years or older admitted to critical care between 12 and 72 hours and needed to have an arterial line for blood pressure management. They had AKI but did not require renal replacement therapy and were judged by the treating clinician not to be hypovolemic and would remain in critical care for at least 48 hours. AKI was de defined by an increase in plasma creatinine 1.5 times or more above the baseline with, uh, without a decrease line of 27 micromoles from or that's around 0.25 milligram percent from the last preceding measurement and a urine output criteria of less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for 12 hours. The trial intervention had a bundle of treatment recommendation with the overall aim being to reach a negative fluid balance following randomization. It aimed at restricting daily total fluid int intake to only medications and either nutrition enteral or parenteral and blood product. So no maintenance intravenous fluids were permitted unless the patient could not take enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition was contraindicated. Fluid boluses, however, were allowed to manage patients' hypovolemia. Matching fluid output to intake was po made possible where to achieve a pre preferably negative cumulative fluid balance. If it could not be achieved, then consideration of ultrafilter by renal replacement therapy could be given. Whereas in the usual care group, fluid management was at the discretion of the treating clinical team. The fluid balance was calculated by subtracting the total fluid output, brain losses, gastrointestinal losses, renal replacement therapy, and urine output from the total input. And the intervention period was seven days from randomization or until ICU discharge, whichever occurred first. The primary outcome was the cumulative fluid balance at 72 hours after randomization adjusted for strata. The secondary outcomes were the duration of AKI in days defined by KD, go creatinine and urine output criteria, the number of patients needing re requiring renal replacement therapy and other cumulative fluid balances, while exploratory outcomes included the days free of mechanical ventilation, vasopressors, ICU and renal replacement therapy at 90 days. Now, this particular study has only reported the primary outcome as it is an exploratory study with a mention that the others were not significant. So a calculation of sample size showed that assuming a difference of 1200 ml in the primary outcome, that was the cumulative fluid balance between the two groups at 72 hours, 50 patients would be required per arm to show a significant difference with a power of 80% and confidence of 95%. Assuming that cumulative fluid balance would be 2,700 ml and thus fluid uh, up to 1,500 ml in the fluid restrictive group, this gave a sample size of 100. The primary analysis was intention to treat and additional sensitivity analysis was conducted per protocol. 
outcomes were adjusted for stratification variables the degree of AKI and the presence or absence of signs of cum fluid accumulation using logistic regression. 23 patients in the uh, restricted fluid arm and 37 in the usual arm were included in the per protocol analysis. So this is uh, something of a commentary on the feasibility of this, that out of 50 patients in the restricted fluid arm, more than 50% of them failed to achieve the protocol, while about 25% could not be included even in the fluid, uh, in the usual fluid care. And the primary and secondary outcome variables were not different in the per protocol population, except for fluid balance. So the sensitivity analysis suggests that there wasn't a significant difference between per protocol and intention to treat analysis. But the intention to treat analysis may not be completely valid given that only 50% of patients with the fluid restriction and 75% of patients in the usual care achieved the protocol. The rest had either protocol deviations or violations. 102 patients were randomized, 50 to restrictive fluid and 52 assigned to usual care. One patient in each group discontinued the rest were included in the per protocol analysis. The cumulative fluid balance was seen to be negative at 72 hours, 24 hours, and at seven days in the patients with the restrictive fluid management. By contrast, it was only at day seven that it reached a negative balance. It was positive in the usual care group at 72 hours and at 24 hours. So there was a huge difference in the risk difference of achieving a negative balance, as we can see from column three, which was statistically significant between the patients who were, who were randomized to a restricted fluid management versus those with usual care. The dosage, the requirement of diuretics was not significantly different. However, no diuretics were used in the group which had a restrictive fluid management regimen. So restrictive fluid management could clearly be achieved significantly and was associated with a negative fluid balance at 72 hours and 24 hours as compared to usual care where the balance was positive. If we appraise this study, it was well focused in terms of the intervention and the control group. However, the per protocol analysis versus the intention to treat analysis does suggest that there were a large number of deviations which render the intention to treat analysis less strong. If a 20% of the patients deviate from the protocol, then intention to treat analysis may become invalidated. And that is what appears to have happened in this study. Though the intention, the per protocol and intention to treat analysis, sensitivity analysis doesn't show a difference, perhaps because the sample size is long, it appear, uh, is small, it appears that it was difficult to, stay, to adhere to a restrictive fluid regimen, ma management regimen, as was seen in this study. The allocation concealment was maintained well by the blocks which were of variable and undisclosed sizes. There was a large effect size of negative versus positive cumulative fluid balance, and uh, uh, thereby validating the intervention, but it is worrying that so many patients could not achieve the protocol. A two-pronged approach which increased flexibility and allows for individualization of treatment may be the strategy to go forward. It will be important to know that when the full study is completed, whether the harder endpoints like mortality, like need for renal replacement therapy and recovery at 90 days is significantly different in patients with a restrictive fluid regimen as opposed to standard of care. The last study which I picked is a study from Postgraduate Institute Chandigarh, which looks at 0.9% saline versus plasma light as initial fluid in children with diabetic ketoacidosis, the SPINK trial. It's a double blind randomized control trial. So perhaps all the bias is removed in this trial. Let's have a look. Diabetic ketoacidosis is increasingly recognized among children. In fact, it accounts for up to 25% of all diabetic admissions. Protocol driven fluids and insulin mostly with crystalloids having a composition similar to plasma is the mainstay of treatment and 0.9% normal saline or various dilutions are very cost effective and useful in almost all settings. However, there is some concern that this is associated with hyperchloremia at 24 hours in the pediatric ICU and that there may be a link between hyperchloremia and acute kidney injury, which has been shown for critically ill adults. So balanced fluids 
with without chlorides have been shown to be a uh, beneficial in adult trials the smart and salted trial which looked at septic shock patients showed that there was a significantly lower number of acute kidney injuries and also a mortality benefit with balanced uh, salt solutions as compared to normal saline but no such study has yet been done in pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis patients which is why the group undertook this particular study it was a prospective double blind investigator initiated rct in the pediatric emergency and intensive care units of the postgraduate institute chandigarh india all children between 1 month and 12 years of age who met the criteria for diabetic ketoacidosis given by the international society for pediatric and adolescent diabetes 2014 were enrolled they excluded patients with cerebral edema known chronic kidney or liver disease and those who had received fluids or insulin prior to presentation the patients were randomized into two groups one group received normal saline and the other received plasma light a by unstratified block randomization with variable block sizes the study was a blinded study since both study fluids were purchased from baxter india in identical 500 ml bags covered with opaque uh, wrappings to prevent the the labels being read and were sequentially numbered in allocation sequence the patient assignment was sequential pa patients treating physicians and the study nurses were all blinded to the administration of the fluid as per a randomization scheme which was one is to one and was generated uh, by the internet on www.randomization.com the primary outcome was the incidence of new onset or progressive aki defined by a composite outcome as change in serum creatinine or output by kdgo a change in gfr calculated by a schwartz formula or an increase in the urinary ngal the individual outcomes were divided into quartiles and the worst quartile seen was used to define aki in both groups the secondary outcomes were resolution of dk time to resolution of aki a uh, change in uh, in chlorides ph and bicarbonate that is hypochloremic acidosis hospital all cause mortality renal replacement therapy and length of icu and hospital stay the data was analyzed as per intention to treat an unadjusted chi squared was used to analyze the difference in the primary outcome and a cox proportional hazard regression model was used to evaluate and to adjust for confounders like age new onset aki and severity of dk and the sample size was calculated using the composite outcome and a, uh, assuming a cox proportional hazard analysis by this 60 subjects 30 in each group were required assuming that 30 out of them would meet the aki composite aki criteria and would give a uh, 80% power and 95% confidence to detect a difference of 0.3 0.3 times lower incidence of aki in patients with the balanced solution as compared to saline 77 patients were assessed 66 were randomized allocated in two groups 34 to plasma light and 32 to normal saline two uh, patients uh, died before they could be analyzed and 66 were analyzed in an intention to treat analysis there was no significant difference in aki based on the worst quartiles the 95% confidence interval is huge from 0.53 to 0.3 to 3.86 there was no difference between aki based on kdgo and p rifle though the risk ratio is 3 once again you have a huge 95% going from 0.29 to almost 31 there was no difference in the individual outcomes of the composite aki urinary ngal creatinine more than 75th centile and gfr less than the 25th centile none of the p values were significant the reduction in aki at various time point also failed to reach statistical significance either at 24 hours 48 hours and all the outcomes assessed in this study failed to reach a statistical significance the so what does the study show it addressed clinical equipoise since no previous study has been done in this population of pediatric di diabetic aki it was well focused in terms of population intervention control and outcomes a uh, criticism of the study might be the use of a composite outcome since the individual outcomes uh, might have been significantly more important and were not taken into account when calculating the sample size also the 
all formulae for assessing GFR are based on a on a stable serum creatinine value, and that is not the case where AKA is concerned. So the use of the Schwartz formula may be questioned. There was very little chance for bias since allocation concealment randomization with blocks of variable sizes and blinding was ensured in the study. There were minor differences in the groups as study initiation. The treatment effect looks large, but it is extremely imprecise because all the 95% confidence intervals are extremely wide. While all clinical outcome, important outcomes were studied, there was no cost benefit ratio. And hence, at present, what this study would indicate is that balanced electrolyte solutions do not appear to offer a benefit over normal saline in diabetic ketoacidosis, and a larger, preferably multicenter study would be required to assess this completely. So, to summarize, my uh, take home messages from these four studies are the AKIKI2 study points that. Delaying initiation of renal replacement therapy beyond the point may be associated with poor outcomes, and that's a hard outcome, mortality at 60 days. However, what is the exact time point is still open. We need a better device than blood urea. We need a better measurement than the blood urea nitrogen. The renal guard looks very promising in providing balanced diuresis in uh, cardiopulmonary bypass surgery taken in account with the editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine talking about on-pump versus off-pump surgery. I'm sure that the renal guard could offer a significant reduction in acute kidney injury based on this study. The reverse AKI study says that flu restricted fluid management in AKI is technically feasible, though it appears to be difficult to achieve, and it needs to be studied with respect to outcomes like acute kidney injury, mortality, ventilator-free and renal replacement therapy, free days, and freedom from renal replacement therapy. And the SPINK study points to no advantage at present of balanced electrolyte solutions over 0.9% normal saline in pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis, but perhaps a larger multicenter study is required for this as well. Thank you all for a patient hearing.